form of teaching that Jesus has is yeah, mainly parables. These are stories with a deeper meaning. Or if you like the literal translation of the word parable, it means comparison. So Jesus is sort of telling a little, some of the stories along with others, but he's telling like a little story and saying, right, compare this to your life. Compare this to what I'm teaching. Compare this uh, to, to eternity. And so that's what's happening uh, in these parables. Jesus tells a story and then he's asking us to make comparisons with our own lives. And do you remember I said that they tend to, to separate into three different types of parable. There is evangelical parable, which is what we had last week. Parable about the importance of being saved, being born again by the Spirit of God. Uh, and then we have didactic parables. That's parables that are, are really just teaching a lesson. And then we have prophetic uh, judicial parables, which are, are parables that are prophesying something. And usually they're also to do with Christ's return quite often. I would say, excuse me, I would say that this parable um, probably falls into that category, the prophetic category. Uh, Matthew 24, the whole chapter, is like a, an amazing chapter. It's just packed full of information that, to the extent that it could almost be a book in itself. You know, I'm not going to be able to do justice to tell you all the nuances and everything of this particular chapter of Matthew, but we're going to focus upon the parable that was given. It's just a short <coughs> parable. If you want to know more about Matthew 24, uh, there is some teaching on our YouTube channel, Stop for Evangelical Church. Um, I did some teaching years ago, it was now, uh, where I go through almost verse by verse just teaching about Matthew 24. It is a complex chapter. Uh, I think, off memory, it lasted about an hour and 20 minutes. It won't last that long this morning, uh, but if you're into that, you want to find out, you know, the background to this whole chapter that is available. Just Google my, uh, so you go on YouTube, just put in my name, and then Matthew 24, and it should come up. So that's if you if you want that kind of deeper uh, teaching. Um, some people have said to me, "Well, how come how come you don't how come you preach and teach things differently to other people?" How, how come there's nobody who kind of teaches and preaches what you do? And the short answer to that is, there is. It just happens that most of them are dead. Because what I preach and teach is orthodox, historic, evangelical Christianity. And frankly, there's not a lot of that about anymore. You know, people have departed from the faith. People have departed from biblical truth. And they've sold you stuff that is much softer, much easier to palate, you know, it appeals to the flesh and so on. But if you were to go back and you were to look at Bible commentators like John Wesley, uh, Matthew Henry and so on, you'll see I have much more in common with those old guys than many of the sort of popular, uh, popular preachers today. So we're going to get into um, this parable and into this, this chapter uh, and we're going to do some deeper teaching this morning. Um, and yet, now, if you've not heard me on this particular subject, um, you, you might have to listen carefully. Uh, you might have to even take notes if you've, you've got the facility to do that. Um, because I'm going to be joining together several passages of Scripture. I'm going to be interpreting Old Testament passages in the light of the New Testament and... Uh, we're going to be showing how all the prophetic passages actually come to rest on the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of his kingdom. This is a Christocentric church, and was Christ is at the centre, you know, and that's how it ought to be. Not that he's an end in himself, because Christ himself says that he, he represents the Father, but it's through Christ that we are drawn into the whole tri unity of God, the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the, the prophecy is Christocentric. Let's just prove that, shall we? Let's just show that. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, this is where, uh, do you remember Peter and John? 
uh, were going to the temple to pray and then they, they met a lame man, they prayed for him and uh, God healed him and now uh, Peter takes this opportunity to preach. Turns out Peter was an open air preacher and, uh, and, and he, he starts to take some of the Old Testament verses and passages and he starts to make them relevant to the gospel. And so what he does is he quotes from uh, Deuteronomy 18. We looked a little bit at this yesterday. So verse 22. Actually, no, let's go back a bit. Verse 20, Acts chapter 3, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, so in other words, this is, Christ is called a prophet, a priest, and a king. It doesn't mean he's not the son of God, but it means that he's a fulfillment of every type of prophet, of everybody who ever spoke on behalf of God. He shall raise unto you out of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. That's absolutely key this morning. Underline it, write it down. It shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. And he goes on to say, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. What days? The days of the gospel. The days where the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, will be preached and people will get saved. Again, uh, in Luke 24, 27, we know that Jesus on the road to Emmaus says to the disciples, beginning, or it says of him, uh, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus is saying, when Moses wrote, he's writing about me. Yeah. All the things in all the scriptures, they're about me. And, and, and that would have been a great Bible study, wouldn't it? Led by Jesus himself, where he's like, let's talk about Moses. Let's talk about his prophets. They all talk about me. Because it's centered upon Jesus Christ and what you do with Christ and what you do with Christ's sacrifice. Will you receive Christ or will you reject Christ? So our text was Matthew 24. And um, I like to try and put these things um, in context. So let's, let's go back to Matthew 24 and we'll look at the very beginning of it. So Jesus is on the Mount of Olives at this time. And he's sort of sat there with his, with his disciples. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now Jesus, I believe, treats these not as one, one big question, but as three separate questions. Now the disciples might not have meant like that, but I believe that's how he's answering it. Okay, so the three questions would be, when shall these things be? That is, when shall this temple building be thrown down and, uh, and, and be left here, not one stone upon another? When shall these things be? Second question, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And thirdly, what will be the sign of the end of 
the world. And if you, if you mix those questions up, I think that's where you start to get confused. And so the parable of the fig tree, in the parable of the fig tree, the, the budding fig tree, Jesus is primarily answering question number one. When shall these things be? And he gives this example, he gives this parable. When you see uh, this fig tree, um, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now we've got a tree in our garden. It's, um, it's not a fig tree, but it's a magnolia tree. And round about this time of the year, Throughout winter, just the leaves are just completely, you know, the tree's completely bare, there's nothing really there. Around about this time, the buds start, the, the sap rises in the tree, the buds start to appear. And it, it's actually quite quick, isn't it? Probably a couple of weeks sometimes, it seems to me, that, that you see the buds start to open and there's little white flowers inside them. You just see that little glimpse of white coming. And I know that within a few weeks, probably, one by one the flowers are going to appear on that tree. And that's the sign that it's budding. And, and there are lots of signs like this. There's time, isn't it? It's spring. You start to see the buds coming up and everybody gets excited. And I say, you know, the flowers are coming. It's not winter anymore. This is going to happen, you know. And what Jesus is saying is, look, there are signs that you can read, just like the natural signs, that something's going to happen. Now, primarily, I think these are warning signs, yeah? Because whilst the Bible teaches that Christ came to heal and to bless and to comfort and to save, we also know that Christ came to preach repentance. Repentance from sin, turning away from sin and turning back to God. In fact, have a look at uh, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 29. And remember, this is Jesus preaching. If you have a Bible where the words of Jesus are in red, you, you'll see straight away this is where Jesus is preaching, sort of just midway down verse 29. It says, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. Is that, is that your Jesus? Is that what he says? Because that's the Jesus of the Bible. This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. So in the story of Jonah, he of the fish or whale, take your pick, um, and, and Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and to preach a message of repentance. Actually, to preach a message that judgment was coming. It's fascinating when you read this, the, the account of Jonah. You know, he, his message was, look, judgment is coming. He doesn't even say, if you repent, God will, will, will take away the judgment. He just says, judgment is coming. And so he comes with this message uh, to the Ninevites. And Jesus is saying, look, as the, the only sign you'll be given is the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man, that is Christ himself, be to this generation. He said, I'm like Jonah. And the, the sign you want, this is the only sign you get. In fact, Jesus is like Jonah in a lot of ways. Have you ever done that? Have you ever compared the account of Jonah, what, what Jonah goes through, with the life of Christ himself? Show you a few, a few examples, a few similarities. Do you remember that Jonah falls asleep in a ship and a storm blows up and they have to go and wake him? And do you remember that Jesus also was sleeping in a boat, wasn't he? And the disciples had to come and wake him up. And uh, we find that Jonah sacrifices himself for the crew, doesn't he? He says, cast me into the waters. Because this is the judgment of God. Cast me into the waters. And, and, and so he sacrifices himself for all the people on that ship. In the same way, of course, Jesus Christ sacrifices himself 
for the world is the same in the world. So there's a lot, lots of different uh, similarities between the life of Jesus and Jonah. Jonah's in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jesus is in the tomb three days. And then, then he rises again. So there's lots of similarities. It's absolutely fascinating. But the message of Jonah, which is highlighted in Luke 11, is a short and simple message. Jonah 3, verse 4. He says, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And that's all he says to them. That, that's, that's the message. At least that's what the scripture records. That he says, I don't like building an argument on, on, on things that aren't there in the scripture. You know, we, can, we can talk, or well, maybe he had said something else, or maybe, I think that's more, and that's it. You know, because that's what the Bible records. Forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. And you know that the Ninevites, they, they, they say, right, it, was the, it comes from the king, doesn't it? Actually, it comes from the top down. It says, right, we need to repent. And, and, they, and as they did in those days, they, they tear their clothing, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repent. And God stays his hand, doesn't he? God doesn't bring the judgment upon them. In Luke 11, 32, again, keeping with this idea, Jesus says, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. So he's saying, look, the, 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 the men of Nineveh, the Assyrians, when they heard that message, they repented, they turned from their sins. But if you don't turn from your sin, if you don't receive me, if you don't receive me, then those men of Nineveh, they're going to rise up in eternity. They're going to rise up in judgment and condemn you because they listened to Jonah, but now someone even greater than Jonah is here. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah is here. They're going to rise up in judgment. And in Matthew 24 it says, This generation shall not pass away before all these things come to pass. And here Jesus is saying in Luke 11, this is what? An evil generation. It's a generation that is not repenting. It's a generation that is not receiving Jesus. This judgment, this coming judgment that Jesus is talking on, is a prophetic fulfillment. And um, you'll find that, that partly it's prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. Let's have a look at that. You get some fairly deep stuff now. And we'll start reading at verse 24. You, if you've been in church for a long time, you will have heard all sorts of teaching about this subject. So um, all I'll say is, bear with me. <laughs> Listen to what I say. Be a good Berean. Go home, look it up for yourself. Okay, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and end thereof shall be with a flood and unto 
the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of the abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What's that all about? Well, the Pharisees and those who studied the scriptures knew how to interpret Daniel 9. Or broadly speaking, they did. And, and the phrase that you'll see, and it's sometimes called this, is 70, 70 weeks. It's known as Daniel's 70 weeks. Okay? And what it refers to is not literal weeks. This is a prophecy, remember. This is a prophecy. It's not literal. And the 70 weeks, I believe, refers to uh, 70 times 7. Okay, I hope don't lose you at this point. 70 times 7, or 490 years. And you notice it started off uh, saying about the command to restore and to build Jerusalem. Uh, that it starts there and it ends with the Messiah, the Prince. So what I believe it's talking about is this period of 490 years, which is so significant, that starts the return and the rebuilding of Jerusalem in 457 BC. Cyrus gives the command, yeah, you can go back to Jerusalem and you can rebuild it. But then there are other important dates, 4 BC approximately, so these are approximate the date of Christ's birth. And then of course his baptism, the start of his ministry, uh, 34 AD approximately the date of Christ's crucifixion, and ending in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. These are massively important events for the Christian church. Just hugely important events. I'm going to go through them uh, in some, some scrutiny. How does it relate to the parable of the fig tree that budded? Well, when you see the bud, the flower is coming. When you see the signs, Judgment is coming. Now judgment upon those who are of that evil and perverse generation, those who reject Christ, but deliverance for those who will receive Christ. It's important to see this is like a twofold thing. Because here, remember Jesus is talking to his disciples at this moment. It says that they came to him privately and they're asking these questions. So he's answering them, saying there'll be a sign. Okay, but you need you need to look for. So Daniel 9, 26, he said that the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary and that there would be uh, desolations. He said, he said prior to that, that he would finish transgression and make an end of sins and reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. So you've got two things going on there. One is destruction of the city, which happened in 70 AD, destruction of the temple and the city. The other is that there will be a finish to the transgression, an end of sins, and reconciliation for iniquity. Now just think, just get your prophetic head off for a minute and think about Christ. Think about the most important thing that God did through Christ. Was it not to make an end of sins? Was it not to finish the transgression? Christ said what? It is finished. It's finished. The sacrifice for sins that God required on the cross, Christ says, is finished. And he made a reconciliation. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17. 
therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled. He made a reconciliation. He hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. <coughs> and so it goes on. But you see what it's saying? That it was an end to sin. As Jesus said it's finished, he reconciled the world to himself. God was in Christ through that cross reconciling you to himself. Let's look somewhere else. Colossians chapter 1. Don't, don't ever believe something someone says from the pulpit if they haven't actually got any scripture to back up what they're saying. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. This is massively important, isn't it? This is where, in a sense, all human history stops boom, at the cross. And it starts again with, with, with what Christ has done. So no wonder this is going to be an important issue. And I said to you that the Pharisees knew it was the time of Christ. They knew how to interpret this. Daniel 9. Because don't, doesn't everybody say, are you that prophet? Are you that prophet was foretold? Are you the, they said to John the Baptist, are you that prophet? And Peter said, didn't he, when he got up and preached, this is the prophet, he's saying, isn't it, that, that Moses prophesied about. Well, this is the prophet, and if you listen to him, that's great. If you don't listen to him, you'll be destroyed. And he relates it to Jesus, doesn't it? And the reason he's saying, are you that prophet, is because they know. This is approximate dates, right? They know this is the time of the Messiah. Because Daniel 9 shows them that. They've interpreted it correctly. 490 years from the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. It must be the time of the Messiah. We must be looking, they're looking out for the whole of Jerusalem. There's wait for Simeon. Do you remember in the temple? He's saying, yeah, I can bring back into part now because I've seen, you know, the, the consolation of Israel. So, you know, he's saying, that's what I'm waiting for. So I'm hanging on, old man that I am, because it's that time. It's that time. <coughs> the time of the Messiah. So this is one of the signs, right? That judgment is coming, but also that those who receive Christ, your time of deliverance is coming too. Okay, let's have a look at Luke 21. Luke 21 and verse 20. Jesus again speaking. Jesus says, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, and know that the desolation thereof is nigh. You notice, by the way, the language of Daniel, desolate, desolation. It was, the word was repeated several times. You know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, and so on. Something bad is going to happen to Jerusalem, is what Jesus is saying, isn't it? And when you see Jerusalem encircled with armies, so this is going to be something that's going to happen involving uh, military power, right? You see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. That is your sign. You know 
Now what's interesting, if you read historians like jo Josephus, who lived around about the same time, he says that uh, there was a big rebellion uh, in Jerusalem, and, and around about 70 AD, what happened is the Roman, the Romans sent the Roman army in, the legions in, to deal with that rebellion and that uprising. And that they surrounded Jerusalem. And remember it also said, this generation shall not pass away before these things come to pass. So imagine you're a Christian. You're a Jewish Christian and you're living in Jerusalem at that time. And you've heard all this teaching by Jesus. And you know how to interpret Daniel 9. And you see the Roman army coming along and encircling Jerusalem. You can think of these words of Jesus, aren't you? And what actually happened, Josephus says, is they encircled Jerusalem and they're about to attack it, but then inexplicably they moved back out again. And it was in that time where they withdrew that all the Christians left Jerusalem. And we know they did. Because again, historically, it's recorded for us that they went to a town called Pella. They, they took Jesus' words literally. They fled to the hills of Judea and, and up through the hills and to, the ta to a town called Pella. Google it. Source of all, <laughs> all wisdom. Eh? Uh, but you can, you can find this out. Read what it says in books like uh, Josephus, the, 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 the Wars of the Jews, and so on. He records it. And he's not a Christian, right? He's not got an axe to grind about this. He's just recording history. And, and then, once they had withdrawn, they, they uh, what do you call it? They reassembled and they started to attack Jerusalem. One of the signs. One of the signs. It's the, the fig tree is coming into bud. It's going to produce a flower. Not something beautiful, but something destructive. You know, it's a warning parable, Jesus is, is warning. But it's also not just the destruction of those who are in Jerusalem, it's the sign of deliverance. Your deliverance, this is the time. Get out of Jerusalem. God has made provision for those Jews who received Christ. Saying, you know, you receive Christ, you receive my teaching, my word. Time for you to go, it's time to get out. Third sign, Daniel 9, uh, 27. He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation, an oblation is an offering to God, to cease, and he shall make it desolate. Again, Luke 21, 20. Know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So it's going to cause the sacrifice and the offerings to stop, to cease. Now this was, would be unthinkable to most Jewish people because the, the temple is in Jerusalem. That's where you go to do the sacrifices. Without the killing of those uh, uh, animals, without the animal sacrifices, their sins were not covered. So that was the, you know, it was like whatever else happens, the center of what we believe is in that sacrifice. Why was that so important? Because it was a foreshadowing of Christ, the Lamb of God. The real sacrifice that God was going to bring for, for those who would receive Him. You know, that Christ is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And so once Christ had come, there was no longer any need for those animal sacrifices. And so what happens is, the animal sacrifices stop. This is, there is not a bigger sign to those people living in Jerusalem at that time that something really, really majorly important has gone down. But why did it stop? It's a quote from um, a history book that I've got. Uh, it's written by uh, this guy, Abraham Leon Sakar, I'm not sure. Well, he's Jewish, right? And he writes about the history, the book is called The History of the Jews. And he writes about this time, uh, the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. And he says, the Jews died by thousands more from famine and plague than from wounds of war. So, so they're under siege. And, and there's actually recorded that, that 
it got so desperate, they were so hungry that parents were fighting their children over, over literally refuse, just something to eat. People were escaping out of the walls at night to dig up a root or something to eat and, and they were usually caught and killed. Uh, they, they, they crucified, because that was the Roman method of, uh, of killing and, and of, of torture, they crucified over 500 people around the walls of Jerusalem. That was, it, was a, it was a horrific time to be in Jerusalem. You know, you just were not getting out of there uh, alive. And you imagine if you were that starving, you're not going to be making animal sacrifices, are you? You're eating the animals. And so at this time, it says, it says here, this quote from the book, soon it was necessary to discontinue the sacrifices which had been made, which had been offered every morning and evening. <coughs> Unthinkable that, that it could be stopped. Unthinkable that there would be no more sacrifices in the temple, in Jerusalem. But God says it will happen. It will stop. I have prophesied it to be so. And, and sure enough, that's what happened. He caused the sacrifice and ablation to cease because God can stop anything. Yeah? Any people, any king, any movement, any denomination, any international ministry, God can stop it. Just like he said to Belshazzar, remember uh, King Belshazzar and, and, and in uh, the book of Daniel, uh, a hand appears and writes on the wall, Tekel, Tekel, I don't know <laughs> and what it is in Chaldean, but, but he says, your days have been numbered. You have, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, and that's it. You know, your kingdom is finished. And, and even as he's telling him those things, that, uh, uh, who is it, the, the Medes and the Persians come along, and they, they, they're the next big kingdom, the next big empire. And it's like, that's it, they're even here at the palace now. You shut down, that's it, it's over. You know, God could have brought the Assyrian Empire to its knees, but he sent a man called Jonah. Isn't that amazing? He could have said, right, your sins, they're too much. I'm going to bring judgment on you now. But he sent Jonah instead to warn them as a sign to warn them. He could have said to the people of Jerusalem, that's it now, you know, you, you, you're following these Pharisees, you're no longer following the laws of Moses that I've given you, that's it, I'm going to destroy you. But he did he sent his own son as a sign. As a sign of God's grace to them. A sign of mercy. When the branch is tender and pulleth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Terrible calamity brought against the Jews at that time. I wonder if you pondered this. It was brought by God. Brought by God. Oh no, it wasn't. It was the Romans. They came. That, that, that evil pagan nation. Yeah, but God has done this many times. Do you know your Bible? Do you know the Old Testament? He, carried, he allowed his people to be carried away into exile, into Babylon, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. That, that, that psalm says, you know, and the people, the people who carried them off said, sing us a song, sing us a song from your land. They said, we can't. Because we're so grieved with what's happened. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They're carried away by a foreign pagan power. Same happened with the Assyrians. The Assyrians carried them, took them into exile. You know, and it's happened time and time again. Wherever God's people turn their back on God, whenever they rely on something other than Faith in God. Then God will discipline them. And if they will not listen, then judgment comes upon them. 
Christ came to his own, and his own received him not. Now that doesn't mean that no Jew ever became a Christian. Paul is Jewish. Peter is Jewish. Matthew is Jewish. You know, the, the early church are all Jewish. But it's saying the large part of what Jesus called that evil generation rejected Christ. So why is this judgment, this terrible judgment, coming upon Jerusalem? One reason and one reason only. You rejected Jesus Christ. That's what we read in Acts 3, wasn't it? Anyone who will not listen to this prophet shall be destroyed. God gave that warning. Got to listen to Jesus. And instead of listening to Jesus, what did the Jewish council, what did the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, what did they do with those Jews who were listening to Christ? They persecuted them. Now the Romans also persecuted them, and other people persecuted them. But primarily at first, it's coming from the Pharisees, isn't it? It's coming from uh, the Jewish leaders. You know, Paul was a Pharisee. What was his job? To go and get those pesky Christians and, you know, chain them up and bring them back and, and kill them. So God repays those who have rejected Christ with judgment. He destroys their temple. He destroys their city using the Roman armies and history of judgment. But also, God is repaying those who persecuted the Christians. That is those Jews that rejected Christ. For those Jews that received Christ, they're delivered. Yeah, God, God offers deliverance, doesn't he? So when you see this city encircled, then this judgment is near. Uh, you're going to flee to the mountains in Judea. There's a place of sanctuary for you there. So it's the, the, the budding, metaphorically, of, of that tree, that fig tree, those signs are signs of judgment to those who reject Christ and signs of deliverance to those who've received Christ. As simple as that. In fact, Paul goes on uh, in the New Testament later on in 2 uh, Thessalonians, to say, seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. He says it's right. So he's saying, don't feel sad about this. It's righteous of God to repay those who trouble you. Now it might not happen straight away. You know, many Christians around the world today suffer uh, persecution and, and, and are imprisoned and are tortured and, and so on and suffer terrible things for their faith. But one day God will recompense them. One day God will pay back those who have treated them like that. And, and I say this, you know, as a warning today as well. You know, there's a lot like on the internet and social media and so on. There's a lot of mud thrown at other preachers, or you know, particularly like famous Christians and so on. And I've got no problem with telling the truth about you know, or pointing out that someone's doctrine is wrong. But when it becomes personal character assassination of people, you know, just because they've got a different doctrine to you, be careful because I believe that God still defends His people today. And will still recompense those who are malevolent towards towards his his people. And and even if that person has died a long time ago, well, uh, they are with Christ in eternity. So God will still recompense those. So I, I think it's important to bear in mind that. Christ brings comfort, he brings salvation, he brings peace, praise God, but he also brings judgment. He also teaches repentance, to turn away from sin and to turn back to God. And to understand that, you know, as a man sows, so shall he reap. You know, the phrase that the scripture uses in Galatians is God is not mocked. In other words, don't take the mickey with God. Because you will, just like 
Uh, these people received back judgment because they rejected Christ and because they persecuted uh, Christ's church in the same way anybody else who rejects Christ, who rejects that prophet, will be destroyed. Uh, they will be recompensed for how they have treated the righteous. You know, these are serious things. Watch out for the signs of that judgment. But keep in mind the people of Nineveh that Jonah came to them and he said, was it 40 days? Just 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He said, it's going to happen. But they repented. Yeah, they, they, they said, we've been living wrong. What we're doing is wrong. God's going to judge us for that. He's going to punish us for that. Therefore, we need to repent. And God received their repentance. He said, yeah, okay, that's it. The judgment is now removed from your lives. And that's the mercy of God. You know? Consider the love of God but also the severity of judgment. And let that drive you to be right with God. Let that drive you to take following God seriously and get right to Him because you know that is the best place to be is abiding in the love of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, Lord. And... Uh, just pray for each one of us. You give us a deeper understanding of your word. Lord, that we might verify the, the centrality of Christ to this book and indeed to our lives, Lord. But, uh, that your Holy Spirit was given to us to reveal Christ, to teach us about Christ, and that we might live in Christ and He in us. Lord, thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' name.